solemn words in our singing there speaking of the hardening of the heart our Lord reminding us of the children of Israel in the desert as they failed to believe him that he was able to deliver them into Canaan and none of that generation as you know save a few were preserved and a solemn thought it is for those who fail to trust and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ well we are proceeding now in our studies in Hebrews and now we're looking at chapter 2 we're thinking specifically tonight about the uh, about the superiority of Christ and more than that we're going to examine verses 1 to 4 1 to 4 in chapter 2 and for the purposes tonight I want to share with you that the the writer of the book of Hebrews was at great pains to prove the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, he had a strategy. Remembering he's very, very well versed in the, in the, in the scriptures of the Old Testament. Yes, Paul, a doctor of theology in the Old Testament, could well be the author of these of these words that's what it says in our authorized version that's good enough for me despite the fact that there are differences in the style and indeed in the Greek which this book is written in his strategy is to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt to these Hebrews that Jesus is superior in every respect to everything they knew under the old dispensation everything in the old covenant is bettered by the new covenant let's think about the headings that he employs Christ is superior, is superior as the eternally begotten son we read about it this morning we sung about it this morning he is eternally begotten and superior to everything that has gone before superior to angels he's superior to the angels think about that you need to remember that the Jewish people had a very very highly developed um, angelology we call it an angelology whereby they studied angels they they had this these conceptions of angels and who they were and what they did and angels were particularly important in their in their worship cultists they, they thought about angels and they had names for for many angels we know a one or two out of the word of God we know maybe three or four perhaps uh, out of the word of God we know Gabriel we know Michael and so on but they had a very developed angelology that's what we call it but our writer is also concerned to prove that Jesus is superior to Moses now Moses uh, had a position in the mind of the Jewish nation which of course was absolutely uh, at the top of the list if you like Moses was the lawgiver he is the one that God chose to not only deliver the people out of Egypt but also the one to whom he he conveyed the law and in the understanding of the writer of this book he used angels to communicate that law and we can see that in the writings which we read tonight in addition to that Jesus is superior to, to Joshua remember Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because of the rebellion which we just sung about today if you hear his voice do not harden your heart as they did in the day of temptation as it's written in our psalm which we sung there 
Ah, but Jesus is superior to Joshua. And we'll be, if we're spared someday, we'll go through these things in great detail in order to show the thinking of the writer here. And he, Jesus is the prophet. You know, all prophets who went before Jesus, they had a vision of the future, but it was a clouded vision. Always the vision was not exactly crystal clear. How could it be? These were men, sinful men, and yet God graced them with a vision of the future in times, here and there. And of course, uh, we see it in Isaiah, we see it in Jeremiah, we see it in Ezekiel, all the major prophets we see it, and in all the minor prophets. Glimpses of the future, but remember, dear ones, only glimpses, uh, as it were, shadows of the future. But Jesus, of course, his vision is crystal clear, and he sees absolutely into the future. And of course, Jesus has these offices. We call it three offices of prophet, priest, and king. And so Jesus is the, is the prophet par excellence. Nothing which Jesus prophesied will not come true. And of course, eh, as we live in this moment, in this time, 2,000 years down the road from when Jesus walked the earth, we have to listen to his prophecies particularly concerning the, the end times when he will return. He is also superior as a high priest. And uh, we're, we're going to hear about that, not necessarily tonight, but maybe another time, the superiority of Christ as a high priest. Why was he superior as a high priest? Well, for one thing, he is, he is superior because he's everlasting. His priesthood who doesn't end with his life because he is everlasting. Isn't that wonderful? Our high priest is forever. And he's not going to die. He has eternal life. And that's a wonderful thought, isn't it? That he who takes us into the very, into the very holy of holies, as we are tonight, he is leading us in there as the high priest superior to all previous high priests. That's all finished. Human high priests, they're all done. But now we have Jesus, and he is superior. Similarly, Jesus' sacrifice. Think about all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Under the old economy, there were sacrifices daily, daily for sin. But not Jesus. His sacrifice is eternal. It is the the last sacrifice, and it is the only sacrifice needed for men's sin, the sacrifice of Christ. He died instead of us. That's the message. He died instead of us. And then, of course, the covenant itself, a superior covenant, and one which was in all respects better. The new covenant did away with the old covenant. Now, we need to be careful here. We are not saying that we, don't, that we don't need the Old Testament. Oh, yes, we do. We need all of the books of the Old Testament to know about the Lord Jesus Christ coming because they look forward to him coming. But the New Testament is, a, is, is an entirely new uh, creation by God whereby men are called to, to, to be his people in a new and a vibrant and a lively way. So we have the, the theme of, of superiority runs right through this book of Hebrews. And we, if we are going to do justice to this book, need to get onto this idea, the superiority of Christ in all the dimensions of his work when he came to this earth and took on flesh in order to carry out this wonderful plan of redemption. Well, tonight we are going to look at uh, several things. Uh, firstly, we're going to um, we're going to look at these at these verses in chapter two. And if you've got your Bible open, that will be helpful for us. Um, I want you to look at uh, chapter two, verses one to four specifically, uh, so that we can uh, we can delve into these these words and uh, suck out the meaning. Uh, so that they can feed us uh, and help us 
in our understanding. So, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. How many words are spoken about Christ and are forgotten and disregarded? Even amongst believers, his words are not called to mind at all times. And of course, the result of that can often be fear and uncertainty when we do not remember what Christ has said. Fear and uncertainty stalk many today. And those who are out of Christ, the fear is very intense. The uncertainty is very un intense. In every department of people's lives, particularly unbelievers, but believers also, if they do not remember the words of Christ, believers also, they are stalked by fear. Fear about health. Fear about the future. Fear about money. Fear about security. And of course, fear about death. There is a whole, a whole industry about death. In my time as a playing bagpipes, I have sometimes been called to play the pipes at a funeral. And it's, uh, it's very sad to be at the funeral of an unbeliever, someone who has no faith, families which have no faith, and instead they, they have things like the bagpipes playing. Bagpipes are very appropriate, actually, for funerals because they, because they can convey lamentatious attitudes. But it's so sad when people don't have any faith at a funeral. Fear of health, the future, money, security, and death. And, you know, all attempts to address these issues, they fall short, leave a vacuum of hopelessness. It's so easy to let Christ's words slip. Look at the words that we read. We should let them slip. The idea here is, is of, the, of drifting away. The Greek actually says drifting away. And if you think about that, it's very appropriate. Uh, if, you, if you are not made fast to Christ, as it were, if the knots which bind you, you know the word religion comes from a Latin root, religio, and it means to, it means to bind with ligaments, same root, religio, to bind, to be bound to Christ. Well, if the, if the ropes which you are bound to Christ with are not made fast properly, then they will slip. And if they slip, you will drift away. So we need to be very careful, as it says here in verse 1, that we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip and drift away. But you know, Believers really ought not to be thinking like that. Because Matthew 6 and 25 to 34 says this. Let's hear what Jesus says. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? 
And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Who could improve on these words, I wonder, which Christ have, has given us and are recorded faithfully here for those who are in fear, for those who are concerned about the future and about how they will manage in a world which is becoming more and more difficult to exist in. So that's verse 1. We need to make sure we don't let our binding to the Lord slip. That we don't drift away. And of course this was a message uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, um, to the Hebrews. But it's every bit as important to us as well. Now let's look at verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Verses 2 and 3 there, which we are going to concern ourselves with. The Jews believed that angels were instrumental and had a hand in the giving of the law to Moses. In fact, as I've said already, their angelology was very developed, as may be seen in the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is not a canonical book. <clears throat> you can still get access to it today. And I understand, I have not read it, but my reading has persuaded me that it is very full of angel knowledge, if you like, angelology. What the law made clear was that God's standards were, and, and these standards were absolutely clear in, in, in the Ten Commandments. His laws described and informed man of something of his character. That's the word which is used in the Greek, character, the character of God. The law also, having described sin, also described the penalty, which is death. Notice every transgression and disobedience demonstrating the impossibility of keeping the law. You can see that there in verse 2. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. So many think that they will somehow be able to mark up sufficient positives in their lives to somehow secure an entry into heaven, not realizing that nothing for sin could atone. Christ must save and Christ alone. This is a very solemn thing. The wages of sin, is de for, uh, of sin is death. Death not simply in physical death, but death in eternity. Separation from God. Preaching about hell is very difficult. It's much easier and joyful to, to preach about the love of God the preaching about hell is hard. 
because hell is so serious. And hell, dear ones, is the, the certain destination for those who do not hear the gospel, those who do hear, harden their hearts, and those who willfully neglect this great salvation. It's so serious. And we cannot play around with the possibility of salvation. If our eyes are not firmly fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and if our hearts are not believing only in him, uniquely in him, then there is no hope. There is no hope. I may have mentioned it to you before. There was a, in Gardenstown, where my parents used to live, there was a, a Christian Brethren Hall there, which had a wonderful poster. It lasted for years, but it might still be there. And it said, Eternity without Christ. No hope. No hope. And that's so true. And you know, I think people don't, aren't able to grasp the concept of eternity. The concept of it. How long is eternity? We can't begin to understand it. I heard a, an illustration once to try and describe something of the beginning of eternity. And if a little bird could fly from earth to the moon and each time it got to the moon it would pick up a little of the moon and fly back to earth a little bird like a sparrow if it could do that and carry on doing that again and again and again and again that would not even begin to describe the beginning of eternity and if we could just convince people of the seriousness of this eternity without Christ, perhaps we could persuade them of how important it is to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and how desperate and how awful it is to be separated from that very source of love. That love which stands now, today, holding out its arms in love towards sinners and saying, Come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labour and are heaven laden. If only we, we could persuade it. And you know, we cannot. It is entirely within the remit of God, sovereign God, to change the heart. All we can do is be faithful witnesses, dear ones. That's all we, that's all we, we can do. It's all we are asked to do, is to witness faithfully that Jesus is the answer. And we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. We have to be able to recognize his promptings, the Holy Spirit. When he says, this is the way, walk in it, do that, follow my lead here. Jesus has said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They recognize the Lord's voice and that's what we have to do. We have to recognize his leading through the influence of the Holy Spirit. I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit is neglected as a person of the Trinity. I firmly believe that. I think it's one of the reasons why the church today is so powerless. Because the person of the Holy Spirit has been neglected. He is not honored and revered as he should be and we know 
that we can grieve the Holy Spirit and we know that we can quench the Holy Spirit and so we have to we have to ask God to dwell within us in a way that we can recognize and understand and hear when he tells us to do things now we have to test the spirits for sure we have not to be we have not to be uh, blasé about this this is important we have to test them because what we're dealing with here is eternal life and eternal condemnation very very solemn not to be taken lightly and very few pulpits today will inform people about the terrible uh, recompense for ignoring the salvation which God provides in his son very few preach about hell today I cannot begin to describe to you simply because I do not know what hell is like but Jesus has intimated when he was on the earth that it is a most desperate place and that those who are in hell are there forever that their that their condition is a hideous condition it is painful and utterly miserable and distressful nobody likes to preach about hell and yet we must because in hell there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth in verse 3 one of the most great one of the most pressing questions that can be addressed to any human being or any human being can ask rather how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation that's the question that's the importance of what we're thinking about tonight how shall we escape and of course the answer is there is no other escape but Jesus Christ no other escape uniquely Jesus has made a way for sinners to escape the certainty of a lost eternity now that word there neglect we can also translate it as ignoring or refusing I was speaking to a man just yesterday trying to witness to him a man probably in his 50s I should think and he announced to me um, in these words of course we are not religious he was trying to do good he was a, what they call a special constable and I was speaking to him uh, about the things of eternity and he had convinced himself that he was not religious of course we know that's a nonsense because God has put an awareness of himself into every human heart we know that to be the truth and that's a that's a, a, an example of ignoring and refusing so great salvation that was just yesterday when our people are out in the street and they meet people they come up to them and they will sometimes abuse them in the street because I've had it you're talking nonsense this has nothing to, nothing to say to me I've got all my ducks in a row I know what I believe and I don't believe what you're saying what a desperate condition what a sad condition 
And it's in situations like that that we realise our powerlessness. How we cannot, we cannot change a man's heart. All we can do is tell the truth in the simplest possible way and convey to the listener the truth of what we are saying. That's all. The rest is up to God. So the answer to the question is that there is no escape from condemnation if Christ is refused. For he has achieved everything by his life, death and resurrection. For those who refuse, ignore or neglect the free salvation offered in and by Christ, there is no salvation. This is the most solemn warning and we cannot describe the consequences of refusing Christ adequately. An eternal darkness, perpetual, unfulfilled yearning and utter, never-ending misery and death. Why would anyone choose that for an eternity? So solemn, so sad. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. And we recognize tonight that he has given us a gospel. Look at verse 3. Verse 3b. Here it is. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. That's the disciples who became apostles. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of what? Of the Holy Ghost, according to what? His own will. You see this? This is all predicated on the great and mighty sovereign will of God, that this plan which we are in the process of executing and being a tiny, tiny part of is all in the will of God. God has planned this from eternity. And what we must do is be faithful in that execution. That gospel which he gave, which the Lord Jesus Christ came onto this earth to declare and showed us what it means. And it showed us what God is like. Remember what he said to Philip. Have I been so long with thee, Philip, and yet you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. That's what we know. That's when we look on Jesus, we see the character and the nature of God in essence. That's our God. That's who we can trust. And he has given us this gospel. And it's a faithful communication through the apostles, through these books which we study and which we receive as being the inspired word of God. That's what feeds us and what we have to proclaim as God's faithful witnesses. And he has, he has proved this in the beginning with these miracles which he wrought through these disciples and apostles. Wonderful miracles of healing and so on. And you know the greatest miracle of all in my view is that the church of Jesus Christ not only began but th thrived and continues to thrive you know, in our world today, in this country, and in the Western world, the cause of Christ is somewhat eclipsed at the moment. But the fact is that all throughout the world, Christians are worshipping God. And as the sun goes down in our part of the world, why it's rising elsewhere, and Christians continue that carol of praise, honouring God, and Christianity is being spread, you know, 
in, in certain African countries is growing exponentially. South America also, we hear about wonderful acts of the Holy Spirit bringing congregations into being. Oh, the gospel cannot die because why? Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know these words, you've heard them a thousand times before, but they are true, dear ones. They are absolutely true. This is the pedigree of the gospel which we try to proclaim, given to us by Christ, handed on by the apostles, preached throughout the world, coming down to us today, and we are to be the faithful proclaimers of that gospel because, because we are commissioned to do so by Jesus. God has said in another place, he's not willing that any should perish. Now we know about the electing love of God. We know about the eternal election and God's eternal decree. But for us, on our side of that decree, we have this commission to preach the gospel everywhere to everyone. That's the commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's what we have to do. And that's what I want to lay before you tonight. The seriousness of the condition that there is no escape out of the prison of bondage to sin except through Jesus Christ except by believing on him he that believeth in me will have eternal life he says he that believeth not is condemned already that's the seriousness of the situation which we find ourselves in tonight and one which we should go home and think about. About the commission which we have received. And we should consider the gifts which God has given us. Your gift might be to make tea. Your gift might be to pray for others. Your gift might be, might be to help out by setting up the church. It doesn't matter what your gift is. Just make sure you do it. And make sure that, that you are developing that gift so that you can give God glory, all the glory that he deserves and which you are bound to give. And all of these things to the glory of God. Amen.